Let's turn to Zachariah. 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 A quick reminder. There's a basket over there for the friends of Southwood that are doing the walkathon for, for um, uh, Walk for Hope. So if you would like to do something or help, help the team out, just leave something in the basket. Otherwise, you can go online and donate online, too. So it's Walk, of Hope is Sat- uh, Walk for Hope is Saturday. So um, they asked me to put that up there since I am not team captain. I'm just walking. So uh, Zechariah chapter 1. Zechariah chapter 1. We're going to have some... uh, That's the outline we'll be using for tonight. Prayerfully, we stick to it as much as possible. Uh, Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this evening, for the ability to come together, to to hear from you, to to spend time in your word, to uh, spend time with each other, gleaming from your word, uh, again, sharpening each other. Father, as we do this, uh, we just want to take in information. We want to know how these people dealt with where they were at spiritually and then how you d- directed them and how you brought forth a prophet to speak your words to them. They didn't have to think their thoughts and their human wisdom. They, they had the exact thoughts that God wanted them to have. And as we take time in this, we want this to not only just be a uh, uh, walk through history, but but a walk through how your plan has unfolded for the nation of Israel. We thank you for this time. We dedicate it to you and your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, Zechariah chapter one. Uh, let me give you two time markers. And one of the things I wanted to do is is give you because I kind of said last time we met that this book is longer than uh, in time frame than Haggai was. So when you get to chapter 1, your time marker is about 520 B.C. It's a, few, it's a month or so after uh, Haggai started. But if you just put a time marker in for, uh, above chapter 1, uh, 520. That, and, and it helps when you're doing that to know where we're at when we do things like this. And chapter 9 is about four, uh, 480. So we got about a 40-year run uh, there. Um, so we, but here's the interesting thing. Chapter 1 begins before the temple is completed. Chapter 9 through 14, the temple is completed. So that's probably the better time marker. So you have one set of prophecies that are given before the temple is completed and one after. So that kind of helps with that. And I think next week what I'm going to do... Um, I wanted to do it this week, but I really wanted to get into the introduction of the book. But next week, I'm going to go through some of the prophecies of this book so that when we get to them, you can say, here, we've already discussed this, and just kind of lay them out. So, because um, there's quite a few in here, and that'll help with really grasping the book. Because what's going to happen is, since it's such a long book, and we're going to have a time in between that we're going to be doing something else in the auditorium, which again is 525, we're going to the auditorium, um, we may get lost in the in the trees and forget the forest. So I want to keep track of the forest as much as possible because it's still a book of Zechariah. And when we get view, you know six verses here this week and next week something else, we we may get lost. And what's interesting is tonight's just the introduction to the book, so that kind of helps a little bit to keep us within the framework of what we're doing. And we're gonna have some fun with a couple of words tonight too. So I think it's. I think it's interesting how you look at this and how you want to get it like they got it. That's what we want to work on more than anything. Not how we understand it, but how they understood it. And then how we can now apply it to what's going on in our lives and what's going on with Israel. Uh, Israel's going to be a major player real soon. They've been a major player, but with the political scene changing as much as it is and as fast as it is uh, within the world and even here... um, you can see some changes that are happening uh, quite quick, so we've got to keep our eyes focused. The Bible has two focus points, just so you know. Jesus is always the focus of the Bible. He's central to all of the Scripture. But because of that, so is Israel. So we, get, we really have to keep, uh, you know, if we want to be uh, true to the Bible and, and really foundational, we have to understand what Israel is and their part they play in this. So um, keep that in your mind as we deal with Zechariah. And in a few weeks, I'll be starting Romans chapter 9 in Sunday morning. So that'll be kind of cool how we want to work these things together. So uh, I look forward to that. So 
again, keep if you keep these things in focus, it really helps you with dealing with Scripture. Because you've got to say, what's this dealing with? Um, and when Israel looks at it, the, the lost Jews, the blinded Jews today, and they look at the Bible, they can't see Messiah. They can't see Jesus. So they, it, they're lost in the interpretation. And Zechariah is one of those really large stumbling blocks. When we talk to the, that Jesus is a stumbling block, well, Zechariah is the, bi- the big bump in the road. Especially as much as Zechariah talks about the first and second advent of Messiah. So um, one of the fir- what I want to do today is since we're talking about call to return, um, or a, a subtitle could be return to me, uh, but I think that was a movie one time, wasn't it? Uh, so I, you know, got to be careful when you do movie titles. Think you're hijacking something. Um, when, we're, when we're dealing with this, this book again is, is a concentration of prophecies about Messiah. It has more prophecies again than any book other than Isaiah. And again, Isaiah is 66 chapters, so it's much more vast. And some of this is review. I just want to kind of get us in the, in the scope of what's going on. And, it, and it, the pictures, and we'll deal with this next week, the picture of the personal work of Christ that Zechariah lays out is quite intense, and we'll deal with that in an expanded next week. Uh, and, and this is kind of my little mantra, I guess I can call this. Uh, I hope that this study of Zechariah will challenge you. I pray that you read this prophecy during the coming weeks, and there's a lot we can learn from Zechariah, because we preach Christ and Christ crucified, and Zechariah lays the foundation for that. I just, I, I just, if you don't grasp that, I, it's, it's fantastic, because when you see the Jew that could not see Messiah, and you see how clearly it was defined in Zechariah, you say, how did they not get this? And then you could say, get down, to it's just willful rejection. Uh, that's what I kind of look at it like. So my my pet verse for the week is First Corinthians one twenty three. About we we look at Christ, we preach Christ and Him crucified. Uh, so that's First Corinthians one twenty three. You'll hear it again Sunday. Uh, and again, I, I want to bring back what I said last. Oh, look who's here! Brought the wind brought these people in. It must have been a windy day. So. It's the fan. You got to have the fan on. It, it should be. So you're in Zechariah if you got a Bible. If not, you got to steal one off of one of the shelves back there. So uh, here's here's the thing I brought up last week. Some of the Jewish commentators said this. It was very interesting that it was so difficult a book to interpret that they didn't they did just gleamed over and glossed over certain things in Zechariah and I'm sitting there well they didn't see what they don't see the key character of Zechariah which is the Messiah you can't understand the book uh, it, there's certain things we we look at scripture today does everybody grasp revelation I don't think we all grasp revelation uh, we have different glimpses of revelation some glimpses of Daniel we we don't have the full end times so when we look back after those end times come, we'll say, oh, look, I understand Revelation. I got a real grasp of Revelation after the fact. Um, but they should have seen Messiah from all the pointings of Zechariah. And Zechariah, again, has first and second advent. Look at Revelation real quick. Hold your finger in Zechariah. Go to Revelation 19. And I think this is uh, really help us a little bit. Uh, Revelation 19, verse 10. It says, And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said to me, Don't do that. I'm a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So what we have here and we're looking at is Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. If you don't understand Jesus, if you don't understand Messiah, you don't understand prophecy. I, I, I want to be as clear as I can. So when people walk up to you and say, oh, I don't understand the prophecy in the Bible. It's too difficult. Introduce them to Messiah. Introduce them to their Savior first. That's what they need. And once somebody says that, you can say, oh, it's obvious you have to grasp the gospel first before you grasp prophecy. And a lot of people, if you look out there, how many prophecy conferences are constantly in the, They all don't get it 
because they don't understand Messiah, Messiah that who the, who Jesus is. Uh, this means if we don't understand that uh, that Jesus is, is is our Messiah, and if we do not read scriptures in light of that fact, you can't understand these Old Testament prophecies. You can't. Um, and we're going to see that as we go through Zechariah, and we're going to read something and say, "Oh, I know where that is. That's in here. This and that." Uh, we can clearly see that in scriptures. Um, look at Mar- on our way back to Zechariah. Go to Matthew chapter sixteen. Now, I, I said this to a few of you. I think I wanted to change the sign out front. This is where I got it from. So when anybody wants to go change the sign, here's, here's, here it is. Uh, Matthew 16, verse 1. And again, the Pharisees and Sadducees came up to him. And I, I understand why they're Pharisees and Sadducees, because they didn't understand who Jesus was. And they were testing him. Well, that's not really good to test God, is it? And they're testing him. And they asked him to show, show them a sign from heaven. But he answered and said to them, When it's evening, you say it's fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, there, there's a storm today, for the sky is red and threatening. Do you not know how to discern the appearance of the sky, but cannot discern the signs of the times? In other words, you have a good grasp of what we would call natural effects, but you don't have the... the understanding of what you should know is the spiritual. They didn't have that. They should have had it. Why? These are Pharisees and Sadducees. These are the people that teach and know the law, quote-unquote. But look at the next verse. An evil and an adulterous generation seeks a sign, and a sign will not be given it except the sign of Jonah. So what they were going to get was that this Messiah would die, would be buried, and would be raised again. They would get the sign of the resurrection. Because why? They didn't see any, they didn't recognize any other signs. Uh, what's a sign do? Just point you to something, right? So and they should have seen that this was Jesus, that this was the Messiah. And it was very clear and obvious to them, but they, they refused to believe that. It says we, uh, it's interesting today, as a believer, we have the Holy Spirit that's given to us to understand the Word. He illuminates uh, the Word, and we respond, and we understand that, um, what they had at that time, though, was the prophets. Did they respond to the prophets? How did they respond to the prophets? Uh, realizing that this, at this time, the Holy Spirit was using those prophets to give them what? The very words of God. How many times? And, and we'll look at Zechariah uh, intensely, but it's going to say over and over again that this message came from the word of the Lord and it's it's the Lord of hosts that's bringing it. So it, it's over and over again that they're giving you the exact words to these people that they need. And as we study together, Zechariah, we understand that the Holy Spirit teaches. The prophet has given it to us, and we have it in, in our very hands, this record. So I want to introduce to you Zechariah. Um, the very first verse of this book sets the tone for this prophecy. Uh, again, that we, we can fully enjoy what's going on here and again uh we have in the eighth month we're going to zechariah chapter one verse one in the eighth month of the second year of darius now it's interesting remember now tie together what i said last week we're now in the times of what say it loud times of no times of the Gentiles, thank you. We're in the times of the Gentiles. It's a good marker to see this. The last three books in the Old Testament do not refer to a king of Israel. We're in the times of the Gentiles. And God's still doing what? Reaching out to his Jewish people in grace and saying, I still want you to return. So that's kind of get, get the picture of what's going on. I think it's important for us to know that. Uh, Remember, Darius is, is, the, is, I like to use what his name interprets, he's the lord of the pagan Persians. He's the lord of the pagan Persians. Yet Israel is under their authority. Jerusalem is under their authority. They're paying for the project that's being done, but it's under their authority. Uh, basically, Israel's given the, the keys, but they're not allowed to have the kingdom. Kind of thing, if you want to look at it like that. Uh, and they haven't done what they've been asked to do. Uh, it's a fantastic picture to see what Israel, the times that Israel's in. Because although they're no longer in captivity, remember they're re- being returned from exile, 
uh, to their land, they're still under foreign domination and heathen rule. Think about it today. Are they under heathen rule? This is, that's a loaded question. That's one of those things you could be right and you could be wrong. Think about it for a minute. Are they under heathen rule? According to the Bible, they're under heathen rule. Why? Let's do it this way. You're, I hear you mumbling. Who is the king of Israel? There is no king in Israel, is there? If there's no king in Israel, there is no kingdom. They're under heathen rule. It's just as easy as that. They can't, they have their king. I know everybody gets all excited. 1948, Israel got back their land and they were sent back to their land. They did not get back their land. Who owns Jerusalem? It's a, it's a mixed bag, isn't that? They don't own it. So how can they have, not have Jerusalem, not have the temple, not have that area, and they, you say, oh, they got their land back. They haven't got their land back. Their land is occupied. Right? They're occupied. They're surrounded by heathen. Okay? That's not what God had intended for them. Um, let's kind of walk through, since we're talking like this, let's walk through some of Israel's history and let's recall it. When did Israel begin as a nation? So this is kind of interplay. When did they begin as a nation? What? No. In biblical history, when was their first time they became a nation? Moses did what? What did he do? Oh, to make them a nation. Paul called, they were called out of Egypt. And when they were in the wilderness, God gave them a constitution. We have a constitution, this nation, the last I checked. I don't know how well we hold to it. I don't have it memorized. People say we're not doing it justice, whatever. Israel didn't do their constitution much justice either. But they had a constitution that was given to them by who? God. Okay. Um, so they, they exited Egypt and they, they, were, they were entering their land. And when they went to enter their land, they were looking around them. And God, who was sovereign over them at that time, who had protected them, who had guided them, who had oversaw everything that happened, when they were brought into land, they asked God a very simple question, they, which was not very nice. He said, well, I, we want to have a king just like everybody else. And God was very, very uh, disappointed in his people because he was their king. They were supposed to be a, a theocracy. God was to rule over them. God was ruling over them. And they looked around them and they wanted to be like everybody else. That's a very bad place to be. I think Christendom is going that way today. They want to be like everybody else. So it looks like a local coffee shop sometimes. And it sounds like a local coffee shop. And what you're usually getting is a bad cup of joe in some of these places. But they wanted to be like everybody else. So they wanted a king like everybody else had. And what did they end up with? A king like everybody else had. His name was Saul. Okay, and um, we see from, well, let's just do this. Go, let's go to 1 Samuel. I know we're, we're going to get in Zechariah at some point, I promise. But I think you need to see this because we're at the end of where the Old Testament's come into a close. But this is, in 1 Samuel chapter 8, this is where their demand was for a king. And I want you to see how God responded to that, I think, is more important than anything. So let's begin in 1 Samuel 8. Um, let's start in verse 4. 1 Samuel 8, verse 4. This says, Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. And they said to him, Behold, you have grown old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king for us to judge us like all other nations. That's a really bad place to be. Because notice how what response comes to them. But the thing was displeasing in the sight of Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, this is very important words, Listen to the voice of the people in regard to all they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. So when we talk about Israel's rejection of their king, when Jesus was here, it was not the first time they had done it. And some people say, look, they rejected their king. Not the first time. Think about it. Interesting, isn't it? 
They had the they had the perfect setup to say, God, we want you to be king. Rule us. Now when we go into Zechariah, what's the key phrase used in Zechariah? The Lord of hosts. He's in charge of the heavenly armies. That makes him commander in chief, if you don't realize that. That makes him the sovereign. That makes him king. Because he can control all the forces. So kind of keep that in your mind too as we go through this. The height of Israel's kingdom, the zenith of Israel's kingdom, was not under Saul. It was under the real king that God had set up, which was David and David's son, Solomon. That was the height of the kingdom. That was it. Uh, It was about, I don't know, 80 years, I guess it went, that under that time period where they were the grandest, where they had most of the land that we're supposed to have, but they never had all of it. Um, And... Then Solomon dies and corruption kicks in. The kingdom is divided. One of them is followed from the sons of David, which is Judah, the southern kingdom, which would be Judah and Benjamin, and the ten northern tribes follow a, a, a bad general, per se, uh, a, a leader that corrupts them. And here's what happens in the northern kingdom. If you want to be king, kill the king. And you could be king. In the southern kingdom, if you want to be king, you better be in the line of David. So you kind of keep that focus, what's going on with that. Because during that line of corruption, the northern kingdom is put into captivity in 721 B.C. and by Assyria. And after that captivity period of time is over, they're scattered. They are no longer brought back in. Now, there's records of where they went, but they're no, no longer gathered back into the promised land. A few trickle in with the southern kingdom, but the southern kingdom, when it's regrouped after the Babylonian captivity, is basically still a two-tribe conglomerate, okay? Even though other tribes come in, and we know in the New Testament, a lot of people say, I'm from the tribe of this and tribe of that. So uh, there's no such thing as a lost tribe. And if if there was, God knows where they're at. Uh, I remember as a kid, when, 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 uh, when I was in temple one day, somebody asked me, can you do this? And I said, I always thought this was what? What is that? Anybody remember? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. He's got that. But we, we do get this from Star Trek, right? This is temple. You were you were a tribe of of the priests if you could do this. And I go, okay, I'm a. Pr- who can, I, how, anybody in the room can do this? You're not Jewish. Why are you doing that? <laughs> but I'm just saying, most people can do that. It's not a trick. Um, but that's not a marker. The the thing is, there's no records. There's no proof. In in in, in 606 BC. The southern kingdom fell into captivity, uh, basically because they disregarded God's word. Um, Then we have a period of prophets. That prophet after prophet warns Israel both in the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom where they stood with God. And the bluntest of them all is Jeremiah. Uh, So if you really want to get a really earthly, in-your-face book, go read Jeremiah. Jeremiah. we now happen to be around 538 B.C. where we're getting close to get Zechariah's time. There's a, there's a, the exile is allowed to come back by, the, by Cyrus, the, the Persian. They're allowed to come back. And about 42,360, according to the Bible, come back. That's the group we're dealing with right now. It's not a very large population. 42,360. Uh, they had built the altar. They had began to fill the foundation for the temple, but they stopped building to build their homes, and they became indifference. Now, I want, to be, I want to be clear. Indifference means opposition to God. You ever heard of that? I'm, I'm, I'm neither on that side or this side. I just stand in the middle. There's no such thing. There's no middle ground. If you're indifferent to God, you're in opposition to God. And that's, that's where we're at with this. And I want to be clear with that because some people say, well, I don't care one way or the other. You know, uh, uh, you go talk to somebody about the Lord and they say, well, I don't care. I'm not a religious person. You're against the Lord. I want you to be, make sure you put them on the side they should be on. Uh, there's, no, there's no such thing as being saying, well, I'm neutral. Uh, there's no Sweden when it comes to the Lord, I guess is the best way to put it. Uh, uh, um, Haggai, we, we, when we finish Haggai, Haggai speaks to Israel to begin to build the temple. And what he basically says is the Matthew verse, which says, seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom. What's your priority? 
That's what Haggai's message basically was. Um, since Haggai preaches that message and gets the people to come around, within four years the temple will be built. That same setting with Haggai in the background saying, put the Lord first, seek first the kingdom of the Lord, is the same background for Zechariah. So we're in the same atmosphere that's, that's going on. Uh, remember, the prophets were to stir people to worship God. How? That's the question we got to How do you stir people to worship God? Well, how did, how did Israel worship God? Ask yourself this. What was Israel's worship of God? How did he, they show God's worth? That's a better way to put it, isn't it? Any of you scholars? Come on, help me out here. How, does, how do you show God his worth in, in the Old Testament time period? What? Sacrifices? Okay. What else? Sacrifices need what? Structure. They, they need the structure. They need the building. Remember, the first sacrifices that God, God ordained that he set up within the Exodus generation, they made a tabernacle. And he told them how to do the structured and a very detailed Leviticus. Read Leviticus of the detail of the sacrifices. It wasn't like, oh, we did one sacrifice today, we're good. No, this was a continuous job. It wasn't a time the fires went out. There was uh, constantly, there was different um, cores and, and courses of priests that constantly came in and out and in and out doing different jobs. It was the busiest place in the world. Uh, Josephus tells us when Christ was crucified, uh, just that Passover, just that Passover, a quarter of a million lambs were slaughtered. Now just think that the, uh, the uh, ability to get all those done and to get those sacrifices done and to have it done in an orderly fashion and not spend, what, months? <laughs> we're talking about a day's. Within two, three days, those had to be done. He actually said the blood flowed from the Temple Mount into the valley. Think of it. I know it sounds gory. I know nobody's eating. Uh, it's, but that's the picture you've got to get. Because what you want to see is the Temple represented something died for sin. Constantly. Something had to go between God and man. The access was not just go freely. That's why when we talk about Christ, what he represents and, and the significance of the tabernacle or the temple, you got to see, you got to really get the visual because Israel was a very concrete people. They saw this. They heard this. They, I, this, I don't want to be tacky, but they smelt it. It was not a, a wonderful smelling place. It wasn't a great job saying, I'm going to grow up to be priest. And, and basically, you had to bathe. You had to have clean cl courses of clothes to put on because you got that on you. You had to go get cleaned. You had to wash. You had to do this. I mean, it was a crazy, crazy routine. But in order to worship God, you needed the temple. You needed to have the mind of the prophets. What I mean by the mind of the prophets, you got it right in front of you. It's called the Bible. You had to know what the prophets had to tell you about God. First prophet was Moses, right? What did Moses tell us about God? Well, first five books of the Bible tell us a lot about who God is. Um, and one of the things that it says in there is God is giving you these, these orders, these, these commands, these statutes, so you can obey him and you will be blessed. That was the Old Testament constitution that Israel had. And if they did not have that temple... They were in outright disobedience. It's, it, there's nothing else I can say. Because they're not under what we're under. We have the tabernacle who came and died for us. Right? He's the one that tented among us. They didn't have that. So if they didn't have that, they had to have the temple, which they didn't have. So that brings us to Zechariah chapter 1, verse 2. You know, how did I do that? Very simply. <laughs> this is how we did this. And it says, because we've already dealt with most of verse 1, it says, Thus the Lord of hosts uh, says, This people says, This time has come. I'm in, I'm, I'll be all right. I'm in Haggai. <sighs> the Lord was very angry with your fathers. What a great way to start a book. The Lord was very angry with your fathers. Um. 
Just think for a moment. If God's angry with you, are you, are you, are you in trouble? If God is angry with you, do you feel like there's something awry? But they added a word. Not God is angry with you. God was very angry with your fathers. Very angry with your fathers. You know, um, my joke with my kids, since there's only one in here right now, I can get away with it, was, go ahead, I could take you out and make another one just like you. Of course, it didn't work out. They all were different. Um, but with God, he could do that. And with, with a God that's angry, you got to ask a question. How do you develop that word? How do you say God's angry, but he's not only angry, he's very angry. You think about that. Um, let's drop back before we even deal with Israel. God was angry. Does he say that verbiage to Noah? In Noah's time, does God say he was very angry? Let's look at it. Let's go to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. Because we could say this. We know in Genesis 6, God's going to judge the world. We would assume if God's going to judge the world, he's what? What kind of angry? They would think he's very angry, right? I mean, that's, that's kind of what I would say with that. Um, let's start in verse 4. Genesis 6, 4. Well, let's go to verse 1. We'll just go to verse 1. Now it came about when men began to multiply in the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he is also his flesh. Nonetheless, his day shall be 120 years. No language of anger yet. Is there, is there any language that says God's absolutely hot, I guess, with anger? Uh, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also after, after when the sons of God, uh, God came in the, in the, into the daughters of men, and they bore children, and those, <clears throat> excuse me, those were mighty men who were of old men of renown. Then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of his thoughts, of his heart, was e only evil continually. Or is there any language of anger yet? Okay. And the Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. Any language of that? There's no language that says God was ferociously angry. Do you see it? Okay, I'm just making sure we don't we see it. we we see what's there. And the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from animals from man to animals to creeping things to birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I've made them. Is he angry? Isn't that interesting? God is not angry angry and he's going to judge just think about that for a minute and you would say wait a second if 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 god's going to judge he has to be angry i, I don't see that what is it saying god is what god's sorry that's what's coming across to me that god's saying you know maybe i've done something no, no that's not what he's saying i want to make sure you understand it. he's not saying i did something wrong but god's saying I, I, i'll be the one accountable i'm going to wipe him out and we'll start again but there's not anger I don't hear the righteous anger uh, that, that would come across here. And then it says, to even add to, add to that, it says in verse 8, but Noah found favor in the eyes of God. That means Noah was able to get God's grace in the midst of this. I don't see anger. Okay? Uh, it doesn't say anger. But look with me, go to Leviticus chapter 10. We're going to see what provokes God's anger. Okay? That's, this, is, this is so interesting because God says he's angry at these people. He's never been angry at other, any group of people like this. And we've got to say, what provoked God to be not only angry, but it says what? Very angry. I want to make sure you get that. Because, you know, there's certain things that always, I, I giggle. Um, anybody remember A Few Good Men? Remember the line in the, in the, in the scene, and, and she objects, and then she, instead of objecting, she what? Anybody remember? She strenuously objects, objects and, and the other lawyer says to her, what do you mean, stre you object, you object. What's the strenuously? Sometimes we add words we really don't need to add. When God adds words, he's, it's important for us to understand why he adds those. 
So in Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1, it says, Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took their respective fire pans, and after putting fire in them, placed incense on it, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from the presence of the Lord, and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, It, it is what the Lord spoke, uh, saying, By those who come near me, I will be treated as holy, and before all the people I will be honored. So Aaron therefore kept silent. Moses called also Mishael and Elisaphan, uh, the sons of Aaron's uncle Uziel, and said to them, Come forward, carry your relatives away from the front of the sanctuary to the outside of the camp. So they came forward and carried them still at their tunics, to the outside of the camp, as Moses had said. Now it says, now it didn't say God was angry. It said God did what? God now cast the focus on what he did to them. God's not keeping it to himself. He's saying the Lord consumed them and they died. Why did they uh, have this happen? Why did this judgment happen? It says it very clearly here. They brought strange fire from the Lord. They basically disobeyed what he had commanded them. Was God's commands clear? Were they concise? You know, here's the interesting thing. When God gives a command and says, do it this way, you do it the way he says. What they had done was they said, you know, my wisdom is better than God's wisdom. I got strange fire. What that means is fire that God didn't order. There was a certain compound that the priests made to mix together to present and burn before the Lord. We don't even know what the compound is. But we know that he gave it and there was that's what it involved. And they said, well, we got a better thing to burn. Go ahead, bring it in, see what happens. Not a good thing. Go to Numbers chapter 16. And what we're doing is looking at things where we see that God judged immediately... And we're getting a picture to put together of what provokes God. And, and it clearly says it in a few places, which is even better. Uh, number 16, verse 20. Number 16, verse 20 it says, The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation that I may consume them instantly. So he basically says, Mo Moses, you need to move. Because my aim's good, but you're too close. You ever heard that? You know, when somebody says, oh, God, don't strike me dead, and you're going to go, okay, go ahead, because <laughs> God's aim's good. Um, but God's telling Moses, get out of the way. He says, but they fell on their faces um, and said, oh, God, thou God of the spirits of the flesh, when one man sins, wilt thou be angry with the entire congregation? Listen, when one man sins, will you be angry at the entire congregation? And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the congregation, saying, Get back from around the dwellings of Korah, Dathan, and Abram. Now, let's, let's answer the question. Yes. Yes. When a person sins, a lot will die. Yes. Because we know from this, from Korah's rebellion, a lot die. Okay? And what was their rebellion? They sinned, and they covered it up. No. You deal with sin. Look at Exodus 17. Exodus 17. I know this seems tedious, but I want you to grasp what's going on. Because when we get to Zechariah, when we put all these things together, we'll see when God's anger was burning, what had added up to that. Because he's talking about this generation. He's talking about these people. He's not talking about the people of the return of Babylon. He's saying, your fathers provoked me to anger. We want to know what did it. Because we don't want to what? Repeat the sins of the fathers, right? We don't, the, that's what, he's kind of, what the prophet is doing. He's saying, you, you, this is what's happened. Remember what happened. And it's a good way to look back in history and see this is what happened. Uh, Exodus 17, verse 7. Um, I guess we have to pick up before that. Well... I, he named a well. Let's be in verse one. Then all the congregation of the sons of Israel journeyed by stages from the wilderness of sin, interesting place, 
according to the command of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim. And there was no water for the people to drink. Now, I want you to understand, up to this point, God supplied the water, and we did this years ago here, the logistics, how much water they needed every day. It wasn't like, oh, good, we all got canteens? That's, they needed a lot more than that, and it was probably, depends on your math, we could say upwards of almost 6 million people. It wasn't, and animals and everything else. So it wasn't like, oh, we got you know, a family to supply water for. Okay? But there was no water. Um, now, what would God do? Why would God bring them to a place and the first thing they would say is, oh, no water here? We named a town in Oklahoma for that, right? Why would anybody live there? There's no water. <laughs> you know? uh, but, but see, the Israelites were brought there. And you know why they were brought there? They wanted to, God wanted to see if they would respond to him as the provider, that they would say, God, okay, there's no water, but we'll know you supply it. We're good. We're good. You're not going to let us die. You didn't bring us out of Egypt here to die. We've already been through this, right? Verse 2 says, Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? So that's called Massa. The idea there is testing the Lord. Why do you put God to the test? What are you not to do? You are not to put God to the test. What are they doing? They're putting God to the test. I want you to be sure we know what's going on. And the people, uh, but the people thirsted there for water, and they grumbled against Moses and said, Why now have you brought us up from Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Which is like the stupidest thing you'd ever come up with. All they had to do was spend time looking around them and know God didn't bring them out to kill them. He just didn't. Uh, just think this through, people. But sometimes when you're under a crisis, your brain shuts down, you know, and this is what's happening. So Moses cried out to the Lord and said, what shall I do to this people? A little more and they will stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, pass before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand your staff in which you struck the Nile and go. And behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb and you will strike the rock, strike it. Water will come out from it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he named the place Massa, which means test, and Meribah, which means they complained, or they grumbled, or they uh, quarreled, yeah, fussed, fight, fumed about it. Uh, uh, it because they, the quarrel of the sons of Israel, and because they tested the Lord, is and saying, is, listen, this is why God's wrath comes up. It's because, is the Lord among us or not? Is that like the dumbest thing that could ever come up with? Is that your solution? You know, some people want to see these grandeur signs. What people want that? The Jews. We just got through Matthew 16. They look for these grand signs, they, they, but they've seen these signs. Listen, the last I checked, when Israel was going through the wilderness, they had a, co- a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. Who was that? That was the presence of God. And they're, saying, and they're saying here, is the Lord among us or not? Now, keep that in your mind, because when we get to Zechariah, he's going to say, I am the Lord of hosts. Yes, I'm among you. I have fought for you, and I am in command of you. So get the picture of what's being drawn here that I'm trying to draw here. Um, so Moses has these uh, group of complainers going on and wanting to know is the Lord among us or not and I and I kind of say here's what we got we've we're dealing with the rebuke right now um, God's rebuke to them is do you see me in every and any event that you have in life can you see me see what happens is some people get overwhelmed with an event and they, they lose sight they're saying why is God doing this to me you ever heard anybody say that why is God allowing this why is it why is it you know, like God's bringing judgment. No, like God's not absent and God's not bringing judgment against you. Sometimes it happens and you've got to see God in the event. And what's happening is in the midst of the event, if they're not being blessed, they figured God doesn't care. Where did God go? We don't have water. Now, I don't know how long. Uh, we don't have a time marker how long they went without water. But I don't think it was a long time period. You know, it's like having a kid in the back of the car. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? We there? <laughs> Stop the car, let the kid out and say, you're there and start driving away. See if they shut up. <laughs> All of a sudden the kid will go, oh, no, 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 okay, well, don't leave me here. 
here's what happens. In the wilderness, in the wilderness that they were in, they had to depend on God and live by faith. They had to depend on God and live by faith. Those are almost synonymous terms. Like, you got to understand that. If you're living by faith, you're dependent on God. If you're dependent on God, you're living by faith. Okay? Isn't that the same thing for us? Is, is anything really changed? Um, but if you ask yourself, what defined these people? Was it living by faith? Was it dependence on God? Your answer should be, no, they were stubborn. They were rebellious. They were obstinate. They were grumbling and quarrelsome. That's what marked these people. And you say, well, where's their faith? You know, if they only saw God, they would believe. No, they saw God. But their faith was what? On a temporary basis. When the water comes, oh, I believe. Did they believe before the water came? So they weren't living by faith. Doesn't mean they weren't saved. They were redeemed people. They weren't living by faith. Kind of get the picture of what's going on? And notice what's funny. Go back to Zechariah, because I want to, if anything, I want to end on this, because I really want to show you, I want want you to see this. It's fascinating, because you don't get this. Our text state, he was very angry. I want to give you the literal translation, because there's no such word as very angry. I mean, very. There's very is not there. He said, then what is it? Well, here's what it says. It says, God was angry. Well, it says he was angry. Yahweh, concerning your ancestors, angry. So the the phrase basically is bookmarked by anger. So when you combine it for English, so you could speak English and read it in English, you couldn't read a sentence that says he was angry, Yahweh, concerning your ancestors, angry. That makes no sense, right? You just say God was very angry. No, he was bookmarked with anger. From the beginning to the end. Where are we at now? We're towards the end. Remember, we're at the times of the Gentiles. And these people have angered God constantly. And he's warning this generation not to continue in that pattern. So it's a rebuke. Don't do it. He says it very clearly. Um, Because they were marked, basically, uh, that generation was marked by what God had, that they had angered God. And if we know anything about it, they wandered for, for years in years in the wilderness. I always want to know if archaeology ever goes in there and digs in the sands of the, of the Sinai, how many Israelites would they really find? It would be an interesting, because sand keeps piling up in that area. How far would you have to dig? But there's bodies out there. Um, verse 3, we'll just pick up real quick in verse 3. Uh, and I want to just, just introduce the phrase, because this basically has to do with the return. And we're going to have to spend some time with that word, return. Next week, um, after we do some other work. But it says, uh, it says, therefore, he say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts. So he begins with this idea of Lord of hosts. It's used 53 times in just Zechariah alone. So when God repeats something, he really wants your attention. Now, if, if we took a few moments... Um, Lord of hosts is the word Saba, okay? Where we get our word Sabioth from, um, to, to Englishize it a little bit. Um, this, this phrase occurs about 200 plus times in the Old Testament, at least. I didn't count them in my little counter that automatically counts them, gets off sometimes. I think, I think it had 220. Um, but remember, it's different ways it's written sometimes. It says... Uh, Basically, one commentator said this, this implies the boundless resources of, of God at his very command for his people's good. I like that. It says God's boundless resources at his very command for his people's good. Now, kind of think about that. Every time that name is mentioned, what are they reflecting on? What God has given to us, what we don't deserve, and he's extended to us for our good. Just think about that. But the word itself interpreted would be army warfare or war. Not Sabbath. Sabioth. Okay? The first use of it, and let's just take a few minutes. Go to 1 Samuel. And why we're doing this is because I want you to grasp this term. Because if I just say to you, Lord of hosts, I don't know if that means anything to anybody. 
you know, and and I I'm one of those few people that I don't like words that don't grab me and hosts. I don't. Every time somebody says, "Oh, host," I think of somebody opening a door and letting you in, leading you to a table, sitting you, uh, that kind of thing. I don't think host is anything about armies or anything. So I wanted you to get an Old Testament picture of this idea. Um, verse three, First Samuel one three. First, I'm sorry, First Samuel one three. This is the very first reference in the Bible to it. So we haven't had anything outside. So if you can get a picture of this, anything outside of the nation of Israel, not used. Not used. So it all has to do with inside the framework of the nation of Israel. And if we're, we understand this, we're during the period of the last judge. Okay? And it says, Now this man would go up from his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in, in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests to the Lord there. So that's the first use of it. The Lord of Hosts in Shiloh. Okay. What? I'm I'm missing you. Say it again. No. Yeah. Uh, really? And which? Yeah, Lord Almighty is. Okay. What translation is that? I'm curious. Non-inspired version. <laughs> Sorry, that just came. It's, uh, no, it's not. It's, it's not. It's not El Shaddai. That I know, which would be Lord Almighty. Oh, uh, as a matter of fact, note number two, if I would have got to it, says reference to the angelic hosts of army in heaven. The NIV uses Lord Almighty. NIV uses Lord Almighty. So that's not. That's not right. Anyway, so when we talk about this, the Lord of hosts appears in Shiloh. Know what's in Shiloh? This is where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. Who's got to guard that? You know, we think of Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? Who's going to find it? You know, God will find it. That's your answer. You can skip the movie. No, the movie's okay. Um, But if you think about it, you're thinking Indiana Jones is going to find that Ark of the Covenant. No, God's protecting it. And God's alongside it. So I want you to see that because if you just see that the Lord, you know, that uh, the Lord of hosts in Shiloh, it doesn't mean anything. But the ark symbolizes God's rule over this nation. So God's with, riding along with the ark, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, This also implies, I believe, that the Lord is in charge of all his heavenly armies that's included with this. Israel, as we have seen at Jericho, when God, when, when God was at Jericho, uh, he was the charge of the army. What did Israel do to take down Jericho? They marched around and did what? Blew trumpets. Well, that's, that's, and had, no, and had faith. They blew trumpets. They walked around. They had faith. None of that I've ever seen in any army tactics. You'll never see it in any tactical warfare. Then nobody's going to say, hey, listen, if you go around uh, Baghdad and you just march around it a few times and blow some noise, it'll all come rumbling down and you'll, you'll have beaten. That doesn't happen. But it'll happen because God told him to because God was in charge of the army. When David comes around later, David says that he, when he was fighting Goliath, know what he did? He invoked the name of the Lord of Sabaoth. He said, I will destroy you because the Lord fights my battles. And if you go to 1 Samuel, we're not going to do it now because we're running short of time. 1 Samuel 17, 45 through 47, he says, he is the one who fights the battle. He's the one who wins the battles. It's the Lord's battle, not mine. But guess what? David still had to do what? No, he had to have five stones in a sling, right? He had to do, boom. He had to throw the rock. But he still knew it was the Lord would win. What a great way to go into battle, right? All I have to do is be what? Two things David had to have. He had to have a lot of practice. And God gave him practice because he was a shepherd, right? And shepherds had to protect their flocks. And what do shepherds protect their flocks from? It's called the Wizard of Oz, right? Lions and tigers and bears, oh my. Lions and tigers and bears, oh my, right? And David was all dead. And he said, I'm very proficient with this thing. And he slung it, hit Goliath right in the forehead. He went, and then he cut his head off. And I don't think anybody can live for that. 
kind of thing. And, but he, David never said, look what I did. Look, this is the Lord's battle. The Lord will win it. And guide that rock right between his eyes. Israel enters into a period of national rule and they still needed to know that the Lord of hosts was in charge and that's where we're at right now. Israel needs more than anything to understand that the Lord of hosts is in charge and the Lord of hosts would put down any rebellion from within or from without and right now they're dealing with a lot of rebellion from within. Why? Because these people had built their own homes and not had put God as their priority. And, and, and we're not going to go to it, but in Psalm 80, verse 19, it says, The Lord of hosts alone will provide victory for his people. And I really think that's prophetic for when the kingdom comes, because when, when God comes to establish his kingdom, he's coming again, right? He's coming again for what? Judgment and for victory. And he's coming back to fight a huge battle that he will win. He will win it for his people. So it all ties together. So when we, when we go to verse 3 of Zechariah, and we'll pick up here next week, and it says um, that the, therefore thus says the Lord of hosts, it brought a lot to their thinking. It wasn't just a phrase that we just look at and say, oh, okay. You, you kind of get it? So every time we see this phrase now, 53 times, we're going to think all these things, right? Hopefully and prayerfully, we'll think all these things because that's what you want to the Bible has a lot of what I call loaded terms. You can't just read a word and say, okay, I got it. You got to kind of bring in everything that's involved with that. Remember, we're dealing with the end of the Old Testament, and it's expecting you to say, I know the rest that already, that's already happened. And a lot of us don't. And that's why we got to take time in some of these words. So we can gather together right now. The Lord remembers. That's Zechariah. The Lord remembers. And as he remembers, he's still going to defend and protect his people. And he's going to bring them through. And that's a great message of encouragement given to people that had not put God first. And they still know that God's going to protect them. Remember, they're surrounded even at this time by their enemies. They had problems. Read Nehemiah and Ezra, the, 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 history, the, the historical background of this, the struggle they had. With the people around them, allowing them to build, and they, they had a Nehemiah said, I had a trowel in one hand and what in the other? A sword. It was building, fighting, building, fighting. Okay, but God's still going to bring them the encouragement they need to know that God will still fight your battles and still win your wars. And Israel's got a huge history of impossible battles that they won when, when numerous odds were against them. In my lifetime, I remember the Six-Day War. Anybody remember the Six-Day War? Phenomenal victory against insurmountable odds. And it was like, Israel can't win. Yes, they can. Because why? God is still the Lord of hosts. Get the picture? Hopefully we all get it. Okay. Um, let's pray.